So my name is Ricky Olivier. I'm part of the research software engineering group at the University of Exeter. Um, I'm fairly new in the row. I mean, I started last year and one of the projects I've been working on is this project called Project Bluebird. Um, a number of the other team members has been working over periods of time on the project as well. I'm about 50% on the project. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is about the role of research software engineers and the experience working on this multi-institutional uh, project. Um, and then I'm also going to have a light touch on the kind of AI things that are being looked at in this uh, project. So a little bit about the project. It's a prosperity partnership between NATS, uh, which is the national, well, I think it stands for the National Air Traffic Service. It's one of those acronyms which uh, kind of just changed into a name by itself and kind of forgotten what it stood for. Um, but they basically responsible for most controlling most of the air, tra uh, air traffic across the UK and providing air traffic control services. And there's also the University of Exeter involved in the project. Uh, PI is from there and uh, researchers from there working on the project. And then there's people from the Allen Turing Institute also working on the project. The project is supported by uh, investment from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And basically the project will explore the feasibility of using AI in air traffic control. And this will include running live shadow trials in which an AI system is controlling a section of airspace. I must, some people might start panicking at this moment. What I should mean by a live and the shadow trial here is that basically the AI system will be showing how it would actually perform ATC. Uh, and then somebody can evaluate the performance afterwards, but it won't actually have any control over any of the aircraft in the, in the, in the airspace. And that would still be in control of you. Uh, so the project is working directly with air traffic uh, controllers to help manage the complexities of their own and understand the complexities of their own. Um, and then hopefully uh, this project will kind of open up uh, or lead to new discoveries in ways to kind of modernize uh, and provide new insights into uh, ATC and modernize the UK airspace industry. So that's kind of the broad brush in um, kind of aims of the project. Um, so the project is divided into three res research themes. The first is to develop a probabilistic digital twin of UK airspace. What we mean by probabilistic digital twin is going to be like a real time physics based model, which will predict uh, future flight trajectories and their likelihoods as well, uh, which is essential for essential information, obviously, for make for decision making. Um, it will be trained on about, uh, NATS has got a data set of about 10 million flight records, um, and it will be trained on this data set, um, and it will help kind of taking uncertainties and in ATC into account, such as weather, for instance, differences between aircraft, aircraft performances, as well as, you know, aircraft uh, pilot behavior or decision making. Um, it's also, the aim is also, another theme is to build an AI system that supports humans controlling the UK airspace. So currently, ATC is very much a human-centric approach, um, and hopefully an AI system will be able to simultaneously um, focus on the task of high-risk detection of potential aircraft conflicts, but at the same time manage lower, the lower-risk strategic planning of the airspace. And so maybe this will kind of give insights in how we can increase efficiency in the general ATC decision-making process. And so to do this, the researchers will have to develop algorithms that uses the this machine learning techniques, like, uh, for instance, reinforcement learning to optimize um, aircraft paths. Um, and this, the third theme is basically related to human-centric AI. Um, so looking at de designing methods and tools that promote safe and explainable and trustworthy use of AI in air traffic control systems. So this will involve running experiments with controllers to understand how they make decisions and 
also how these behaviors can then also be considered uh, in, in, when training AI systems. And then also we'll explore ethical questions, Osters. How can you build a system that's transparent, explainable, and you know, trustworthy? So I'm probably preaching to the choir with the slide, uh, but here's the definition of a role of the RSE. Um, maybe there's somebody in the in the in the audience that don't quite understand what what an RSE does. Um, but basically they work with the researchers to gain an understanding of the problems they face and then develops and maintains and extends the software to provide the answers. So traditional, as many of you probably know, traditional use of RS uh, research software is spread from traditional applications such as numerical and methods and simulation in maths, physics, and chemistry uh, to being essential for things like data analysis or controlling experiments across different disciplines. So in terms of Bluebird, uh, the role of an primary role of an RSE is to develop and maintain and extend the research software as, as part of the research process. They bring both a dual experience of professional research experience in some cases, as well as uh, professional software development practices together. And particularly some of them have uh, uh, valuable specific uh, domain specific knowledge. Um, and uh, the software, professional software engineering um, expertise they bring to the table aids in the impact of the research uh, uh, through the continued use of the software well after the project has ended. And this is in particular of particular impertinence to project, the aims of the uh, project group, but and actually making use of this, this research that comes of this pro project over a long period after the project is finished. Okay. So I actually went away and I asked, I asked some of the RSEs and we in our team that's worked on the project and a few others at the other institutes. And I also asked some of the PIs and some of the tech, technical leads and domain experts in the project to kind of give me a flavor at this stage of the project. Uh, I think it's now kind of nearly halfway or two years into the five year project or something. Um, and to try and understand what they feel that, like, what was the experience of having RSEs working on the project and what was the RSEs experiences themselves. Um, so to give context of what the RSEs has been working so far on the project, uh, they've, they've contributed significantly to develop and building this AI um, development framework and simulation framework for air traffic control called Starling, which I'll touch upon later, uh, which is basically provides a tool for doing trajectory prediction um, using some physics-based parameterized models or performance characteristics from data. It also allows simulating um, air traffic control of sections of airspace. Um, and it also allows the functionality to simulate um, and replay from real world data. The project also got uh, access to a large amount of data and some of the RSEs is working on a data pipeline to convert these the diverse formats to a form that can actually be used in this framework. So talking to the technical leads and some of, some of the PIs, um, and they came back and said, you know, the ability of the RSC is to understand the research context more rigidly than most other software engineers is quite valuable. Um, they seem to uh, absorb the domain knowledge and learn fairly quickly. So that's been quite good. Also, the other thing that's been good by having RSCs working on this project is that it led to a production of higher quality code through the adoption of, you know, things like version control, continuous integration, um, unit testing, unit testing, et cetera. Uh, and the, the code that's produced is typically better than you would get from a purely academic research team. Um, also the RSEs seem to be good at team working. They would be an excellent working with people with a range of skills from domain experts, other RSEs, as well as researchers. From the RSEs perspective, um, they felt that the opportunity to work on such a large project spanning different organizations and with different um, domain aspects of the domain knowledge needed has been valuable from skills and experience development perspective. And there's also a range of topics that any RSEs can dip their toes into uh, if they're interested. Talking to some of the PDRAs, uh, 
one or two of them have expressed that it's been valuable to work with someone who is both domain expert or at least domain capable, relevant to the research field they're working in, and also understood the code base quite well and can make them the needed changes quite quickly to achieve their research, their immediate research aims. So from the ISA perspectives, one of the challenges, particularly for ones that comes newly onto the project, is the steep learning curve. Um, I mean, air traffic control is a novel, novel field. So that was quite, quite, quite a thing. Most of the responses I've got. So getting onto and getting to, to speech with a whole code base um, take, takes quite a bit of time. Uh, the ways of working has also evolved over time as the project uh, changed. Uh, recently, we have our first shadow trial in early a few months ago in the middle of the year. Uh, and that kind of provided the focus for the overall project um, to actually um, focus our development um, processes. So the current approach of using an agile issues board managed by the domain experts themselves um, to order to prioritize the work has been working very well, particularly now having the, sh the shadow trial as, a, as an objective. And hopefully this will continue through the rest of the project um, as these will get, keep being repeated over regular periods. Um, and uh, there's also a current method of having in-person discussions with the actual RSE writing up the summary for the issue on GitHub has worked much, up, much better than previously. Um, communication, as you can imagine, across a multi-institutional, multidisciplinary team can be uh, challenging. And so one of the things that's been settled on over time is having short bi-weekly agile kind of stand-ups. Some of the people work only on the project 50% of the time, others 100%, so that needs to be taken into account as well. And then also the other thing we have is in-person monthly catch-ups rotated by organization, which has been quite valuable in terms of asking questions, scoping things out, and then reviewing all tickets that's still in, in that's been completed or in progress, and then plan for the next cycle. So that's that's been quite useful. Five minutes. Whoa. <laughs> Gotta move quicker. So I'm not gonna. I wanted to talk about project outcomes. Um, so there's been some research going on, obviously, by the PDRAs in the project and some of the PIs. Um, and one of the things they particularly kind of looking at is moving away from these previously physics, purely physics-based predictions for uh, trajectories used in uh, in in the field to more data-driven, generative, probabilistic models. Um, and we can talk about that afterwards if people got questions about that. So I, I won't talk about that now. Um, so the project outcomes in terms of software is Starling, which is the simulation and AI development framework for air traffic control. That was a big chunk of it um, up to date. And it's basically, as I said, it just provides a way for uh, simulating different scenarios and also actually simulating from real world data also allows uh, simulating air an air traffic control scenario where you can issue commands to the aircraft and change their behavior. Um, so you can then plug an AI agent into this and then train it on that using the real world data in a sense. And then recently for the, for the trials, a lot of work has gone into the human machine interface. I've been told it uses a Redux, uh, React Redux um, layer for the ATCO front end to Starling, and then the fast API for the communication between the Starling API and the, and the AI agent. Um, the AI agent, again, don't have much time, but people can ask me afterwards. I can talk a little bit about it. Um, there's an optimization agent that optimizes a cost function, and then there's some very preliminary work going on in the reinforcement learning area. Okay. So I'll show this slide quickly. So this is a slide produced by one of the researchers, Dr. George Darth at the, at the University of Exeter and Dr. Mark Thomas from Nats. Um, so what you see here in the, so I think on the next slide, I got a zoomed in version here. You got a section of airspace over London somewhere. Um, and the dots, the gray dots in the background is just aircraft moving from real world data. The real world data replays on the left, on the right, is some of the aircraft uh, is actually under control of the optimization agent. 
So the grid, the red squares are basically aircraft that will enter the, the airspace and be under control at some point. Um, and the, on the right hand side, the full green squares are basically where the optimization agent is actually taking control and giving instructions to the aircraft. Uh, so you can see looking at the behavior of the corresponding aircraft in the two panels, you can see the optimization agent produces reasonably acceptable um, trajectories compared to what was observed in real life. Um, I can talk about, about that afterwards in questions as well. So in terms of the, the trial, the first trial was run in mid-2023. Mid um, initially, a group of ATCO trainers was asked to evaluate the system as a whole. In terms of performance of the agent uh, and the user interface, some feedback was gained from that. It went through another develop, quick development cycle to add the improvements. And in another part of the trial, real actors was actually interacting with the, with the system um, and provided user feedback. Um, and it was an opportunity for the theme three researchers to gather information about the ATCO experience and evaluation of the system. So that went fairly well. The overall outcome was there was a positive one. The agent was evaluated good at safety, but with room of improvement when actually passing aircraft over to the next sector to be controlled uh, by a different um, uh, person. So next stage of the project is basically just going through a whole refactoring re, uh, redesign phase. So in summary, uh, it's an ambitious multi-institutional research project aiming to apply human-centered AI to the complex task of air traffic control. It requires an extensive range of domain specific, specific knowledge to achieve this goal uh, and to, to deliver a quality software solution. Uh, and that remains a major challenge at all at all times. Um, and from the feedback I got is that RSEs both provide the expertise in, in software development practices and the domain-specific knowledge or ability to learn domain-specific knowledge uh, to, to meet this challenge. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you, Enrico, for such a great talk focusing on the role of RSEs in Project Bluebird. Um, so if you've got a question, um, you can ask them in track D, GH001 on the Slido. So the top question that we have from Sherman Lowe was the reason to use a probabilistic model to quantify risks and uncertainties behind any AI-assisted decisions? Yeah, I think I think that's, that, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I think... Um, Having obviously having some idea of uncertainty um, kind of gives you a, a measure of how good the decision is, but it also obviously helps with um, transparency on or understanding of why the AI made this decision. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, on to the next question. So, are there any ethical considerations in applying AI ML to the field of air traffic control? Um, but, oh, well, I, I'm probably not the best person to ask this question. I'm always going to work on back end, to be honest. But I think obviously things need to be on. I mean, who's ultimately when you run out, uh, roll out such a system in future, if it ever does get to that point because the process of adopting new uh, processes or procedures in a, in a safety critical environment like air traffic control takes years uh, or decades to do. So whether this will actually happen is a question. Um, but one of the main ethical questions, who is responsible, who will be responsible for, or take responsibility for any decisions or major incidents that come out of uh, applying this to the field. Um, yeah, I, as I said, as I just mentioned briefly earlier, um, it's probably, I mean, we, the, the idea is not to actually have, I mean, the aim is not to say that to try and get AI into air traffic control, it's basically to investigate the possibility of doing it and opportunities to apply it where, we, where it can be, in areas of air traffic control where it can be applied and probably safely applied. So one of the one of the things people are talking about is applying it in 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 simulating environments for training ATCs. 
as okay. a possibility. Yeah. Okay, great answer. And I think uh, we have a bit of a follow up to that as to where it can be applied. So one question is asking is part of the future plan, possibly to incorporate agents into aircraft as well? Or is it just planned to be used on the ground in control towers? I think for this project is mainly I think just for the ATCs, um, so the ground control trials, I'd say. Um, I don't think anybody's looking at, well, in this project, looking at incorporating into the aircraft itself. I don't know, there's one or two other people working on the project here. I don't know if they want to chime in, but I think, yeah, it's purely from a control perspective rather than, you know, having a <laughs> AI agents controlling an aircraft, I don't think so. I don't think anybody would feel comfortable <laughs> Having an agent, agent uh, flying your aircraft, yeah. Maybe one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we've got time, I think, a couple more minutes. Um, so one person is interested to know what needs to be optimized by the AI agent for air traffic control. That's a very good question. I mean, this this is one of the things that uh, the researchers are looking at, particularly with the reinforcement learning, trying to understand what is the actual objectives and what what the air traffic controllers are actually trying to do when they trying to when they um, when they actively um, do ATC, trying to understand what objective functions. In terms of the optimizations agent that we used in the in the trial specifically, it was trying to optimize three or sometimes sometimes trying to optimize three uh, objectives. One that was related to um, a safety objective, trying to keep the aircraft apart as far as possible at well at the safe distance i think it's about a thousand feet vertically and about five miles horizontally i think if i remember correctly so that was one objective the other objective was related to fuel efficiency so i think that was just parameterized as the you know what's the shortest reasonable possible track through the through the airspace and the last one was orderly handover of aircraft to the next sector so you don't want to handle aircraft to the next sector with a with when they enter the next sector, they basically going to cross almost. So kind of like keep them parallel. And you obviously don't want to hand out over aircraft, too many aircraft at the same time to the next sector. So there was an objective related to that. As I said, um, trying to understand the objective functions um, and particularly with our reinforcement learning is something that's, that's being looked at. Yeah. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thanks for your talk. And we'll move on to the second one, but let's have a round of applause again for me, Thank you.